Hello and welcome. I'm Sarah and today I um, made a short video for you on deuterium because Dr. Laszlo Boros is coming on to the channel later to do a podcast and it's going to be quite long and probably quite detailed. So for people who just want an overview or have never heard of deuterium before or are new to the channel and some of the podcasts, then this is about effects of deuterium in your body other than in the mitochondria, because it can affect sex hormones, it can affect your enzymes, it can affect your immune system, it can collect in tissue, and it, there's an association between tissues with high levels of deuterium and cancer. And the amount of deuterium you have and where it is in your body can dictate what disease that you're going to manifest. So if you're interested, then this video is for you. So to quickly recap, what is deuterium? It's a naturally occurring isotope of hydrogen, and it's different to hydrogen because it's got a neutron. Hydrogen only has a proton and an electron. So it's got different magnetic properties. It's it's a different size. It has a diff different effect in water and it, it with respect to the hydrogen bonds. And also anywhere there's a hydrogen in biology, say in a vitamin or a receptor in your body or in a hormone, having a deuterium instead of a hydrogen is going to change the properties of how that receptor or enzyme functions. And that's what I'm going to talk about briefly today. So when it comes to levels of deuterium, it's measured in parts per million. So there is only a fractional amount of it in, in the water, in the food. It occurs everywhere all over the planet in, in different concentrations in different places. And the water that you drink has a different amount of deuterium depending on how close you are to the equator. So the closer you are to the equator, the higher the deuterium in the water. So it's 150 plus parts per million. And then as you go further away from the equator, it's lower. Also, there are other factors. It's to do with how the water was collected. So water that's run through volcanic rock tends to be higher in deuterium and water run through limestone tends to be lower. And there was a study in 2007 that looked at water deuterium levels in the United States. So you can look into that. But since then, there have been lots of other studies, either independent or research based, looking at levels of deuterium in different places. So if you live in somewhere that you do have high deuterium in the water, not to worry, because a lot of people who live at the equator, you obviously get lots of sunlight and sunlight and deuterium are coupled and you need the high UV to be able to deplete the deuterium naturally. And that's why the fruit that grows at the equator is really high in deuterium. And if you live where the fruit grows, you're geared to be able to deplete that deuterium Cold therapy also depletes deuterium as well. So there are practical ways for you to deal with it if you are concerned. So when it comes to health, ideally 130 or, or below, or say low 130s is a good sign of health. It's very hard for diabetes, cancer and such like to, to manifest. When deuterium levels in a person go above 150, that's a cause for concern and they will have symptoms already by then. And 180 is a severely ill person. And then in the 140s, it can cause sort of minor issues, but things that bother people such as stubborn um, weight gain or diabetes, things like that. So when it comes to what conditions have been studied scientifically to have a deuterium component, it's going to cause a rise in inflammation, but that's a big part of it blocking up the ATPase in the mitochondria, but also too much deuterium and not enough hydrogen is a sort of ratio for, for inflammation as well. Again, there are lots of studies on levels of cancer and deuterium, as I mentioned in the beginning, that cancer and the organ in which there's lots of deuterium, there is a, a link there. Also, you have diabetes and obesity. So partly it's an energetic effect, but also it's something called molecular crowding where molecules build up. Because as I was saying before, deuterium doesn't behave in the same way as a hydrogen. So enzymes can be slower, reactions can be slower, and it just causes things to, to backlog. And this effect of molecular crowding is something that is implicated in other diseases as well. Of course, you're gonna get things like chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia because of the energy stealing effect. So our semiconductors in our bodies uh, in the water matrix uh, rely on a proton wire because the exclusion zone water excludes protons and deuterium and the electrons can flow. And also from Einstein's equation, E equals MC squared, because deuterium is bigger than hydrogen, it offers less energy into the system. 
And again, as I said before, mitochondrial dysfunction is also at the heart of chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. So if you've got lots of deuterium in the mitochondrial matrix, they can't function properly to provide energy. There's also the fertility issues and sex hormone problems, say low progesterone or testosterone, and we'll get into that in a moment. And then aspects of having a weak immune system. The, the weak immune system sometimes is, is a, a lack of energy problem. The system just simply doesn't have enough energy to run the defenses in your body. And also there are correlations between deuterium levels and, and aging as well. So that's sort of multifactorial. I said at the beginning, wherever there are hydrogens in the body, there's going to be deuterium as well. And we can think about our enzymes to start with. So they are molecular machines and they have all sorts of jobs in the body of making things, breaking things. And they function for argument's sake, like a little motor or a machine. So when you put deuterium in instead of hydrogen, it changes the properties of the enzyme and slows it down. So it can't do its job as efficiently. And the more deuterium there is, the worse the enzymes function. And this is an effect that's independent of your genetics because we do have variations in how well or not our enzymes work based on the, the SNPs in, in our genes. But then the deuterium is a lifestyle factor which can slow people's enzymes down as well. You can get deuterium in receptors. So I'll just use the thyroid, for example, because somebody might have a thyroid issue as in the symptoms, but when they do a blood test, they've got plenty of T3, the active hormone, but the problem isn't the hormone, the problem's at the level of the, of the receptor. And because there's a, deut a deuterium instead of a hydrogen, it's changed the shape of the, um, the receptor because it can alter hydrogen bond angles. It just makes the receptor look different to the thyroid hormone that's trying to get in. So as that's based on probabilities as well as resonance, the, the receptor is the problem, even though there's plenty of thyroid hormone around. So that would be an also an example of when do, doing a deuterium depletion could help. Then when I made my webinar on cholesterol, I didn't mention deuterated cholesterol just because there was enough in it already. Cholesterol is needed to make pregnenolone, which is the start or the, the master sex hormone. And from that, all other sex hormones are made. So DHEA, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. But I didn't mention deuterated cholesterol in my previous video because when the cholesterol has got deuterium in it, it, it the enzymes that break it down and change it into pregnenolone get confused because the cholesterol or whatever get it gets made into next doesn't look like it should. So again, this slows down the process and it results in lower sex hormones. So it's another way to investigate yourself. So if you keep persistently getting low hormones and you've tried a quantum approach, you've tried all sorts of different things, ways of eating, it might be worth looking at the deuterium in a bit more detail because some people think they're doing everything right, but they are making mistakes or they just didn't know something really important about deuterium. Then we've got um, deuterium in all of our proteins as well. So as I said before, when there's a deuterium it, instead of a hydrogen, it makes the protein look different. So it would change the three-dimensional structure. And then this can then affect the function of the protein uh, in the body. The way our semiconductor systems work in the body, they're embedded in a water matrix, which would be the exclusion zone water, where the hydrogens and deuterium are excluded and the electrons can flow, protons can flow. And first of all, having a deuterium in this system is going to lower the overall energy of it a bit like your battery, because it would be a, a like using a wire for an electrical device that's got a little bit of a of the cord worn away and that the flow isn't quite as effective as it could be on one level but also from a physics level if you think about e equals mc squared because deuterium is twice as big as hydrogen it provides less energy overall in the system so it makes your water battery your system of semiconductors which are, which are different proteins uh, be not as effective as it could be and as I've said before, in the mitochondria, in the F1 ATPase, if deuterium goes down, it can break and damage the, the mitochondria and the F1 ATPase. And then again, that would contribute to problems with energy and inflammation and not enough easy water. So you can just think about it in simple terms is deuterium is bigger than hydrogen. So it 
steals energy and it's not quite the same when it comes to magnetic moments and properties to do with hydrogen bonding so it can change the shape of molecules as well so in saying that deuterium has a crucial role in life because kids need it to grow but just after the age of 20 there should be deuterium depleting instead because they've finished growing and are fully mature it's part of the collagen matrix in the body and it plays an important role there. And then interestingly from Jack Cruz's um, work, deuterium is in the blood in high concentrations. And with deuterium, when you squeeze it or put it, put it under pressure, it can produce UV light. And as we know, the blood goes around the body. So it provides part of this wireless network of, of communication from the sun because the blood can go to the surface all the way down into the tissues and into the mitochondria. So it provides a, a wireless communication system. And that's why the deuterium levels in the blood, it doesn't matter, they're meant to be higher. That's why you never measure those. You measure your urine and you measure your breath, or you do an MRI to see where the deuterium is in your body. So just to finish off, there is a big cycle of deuterium and hydrogen, and it ties in with mitochondria and chloroplasts being the opposing force of one another. Basically with this cycle, the plants use light to split water and they don't like deuterium, but they'll still absorb it. The mitochondria hate deuterium. And then with the power of the sun using photosynthesis, they create glucose and matter from carbon dioxide and sun and splitting the water. Then the animals eat the plants, which contains the glucose, which the which was made by photosynthesis. And then we eat the plants and the animals and we get electrons and protons from the food. And the protons go into the mitochondria to go down the ATPase to make ATP and the electrons go into the electron transport chain to run through the, the different complexes. And the mitochondria then combine the H plus with oxygen that we breathe in. And this makes water, the deuterium depleted water and CO2. And then the whole cycle starts again. The CO2 goes back into the plant and the process carries on. So in this short video, I hope you've got sort of an overview of some of the things which deuterium does in your body and how it's a problem, but also not to be terrified of it either. Because some organisms love deuterium, that's why flies love shit basically, because that's full of deuterium. So they get attracted to it because flies have a very short lifespan, so they need to grow quickly. Also the bacteria in our guts, their ATPase is different to ours and they don't mind deuterium. So our gut microbiome also plays a role in depleting deuterium for us. And I would imagine that there are some strains better than others at depleting deuterium, but that's for another day. <laughs> the amount of deuterium in different foods is something I'm gonna go into with Dr. Borosh because just saying eat fat and protein, yes, that's gonna get you a lot of the way, but some people don't want to do that. And some people live somewhere where they can deuterium deplete really well. And I've asked him lots of questions about all different kinds of food. So it's fair to all the people that listen. And also when it comes to being able to deuterium deplete, it depends on your mitochondrial haplogroup as well, because the uncoupled haplogroups like the T, they're better at depleting deuterium than say a coupled haplogroup, which would uh, be an L. And the reason for this is the L's people who have the L, they're the equatorial origin. So they rely on the UV light, the strong sun to deplete their deuterium. Whereas the T haplogroup is the more Viking one. And they rely on being able to deplete deuterium better out of the mitochondria themselves. But also cold therapy is a vital part of depleting deuterium as well. And people with an uncoupled haplotype are more amenable to cold therapy and also they should use it more. So I'm a big fan of cold therapy. I use it all the time, sort of almost every day. So I hope you found this useful and I hope you find the podcast that I'm going to do with Dr. Borosh uh, later on useful as well. So thanks for watching. And if you have any comments, just pop them in. And if you have any requests for topics of videos, then put them in as well.